Just putting it out there. But I want to tell you something. God has blessed our country. There is no greater country with the export of the gospel than the United States. And so, and, uh, and I haven't even got rolling it yet this morning. So let's ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, we thank you for what you've given us in this country. And we want to just pause and we want to thank you because we know God has blessed our nation. And I pray that, Father, that you break through the bitterness, the selfishness, the blindness, and speak to people and give clarity, even those who aren't here present, but somehow through the internet, that God, that they'll stumble across this broadcast. And I pray that you'd speak to them, Father, and produce in their hearts a sense of gratitude for who we are as a nation, who we are as a people, and we thank you that you're going to do great things. In yeah. Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. So Romans chapter 13. <coughs> yes. <coughs> it happens quick, doesn't it? <coughs> Not COVID, just, yeah, just saying. <coughs> Someday down the road, just so you know, um, because this is a really bad flu. Someday down the road, we will probably have someone in our church who will get COVID. Someday it might happen. <coughs> Thank you so much, Karen. And it's important that we know that that's going to happen. So we don't overreact. We don't freak out. We'll do our best to make sure things get sanitized and things of that nature. It's not like the Black Plague. It's less than 1% of 1% of people who actually die, which is much less than most normal flus, especially in our country. If you look at the death rates of what goes on in our country compared to the other countries, God has blessed America. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Let every person be subject to, to the governing authorities. Let's just pause for one second. I want to take you back for a moment, and I want to remind you of something that you probably already know. When this scripture was written, we're talking about the Roman Empire, where if you said, Jesus is Lord, you might lose your head. So that's the context of when this verse was written. So let's keep it in perspective. Let every person be subject to governing authorities. There is no authority except from God. And who's, who's that, that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever risks authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror for good conduct, but to bad. Would you have fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid. For he's a bear, he, um, he does not bear the sword in vain. But he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath for wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but for the sake of conscience, because this, you also pay taxes. No amens, but I can imagine you're out there. <laughs> and the authorities are ministers of God, attending with this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them, the taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. So we keep this in perspective. We realize that first and foremost, they're talking about not our country. They're talking about the Roman government, y'all, where they would kill Christians for simply stating what their belief system were. I believe Jesus is Lord over life and creation. Amen? And you could lose your life for that. And so they were the extreme of oppression and persecution. Um, you didn't pay your taxes. They didn't, you couldn't put it on your visa card. You would go to jail. You would have all kinds of difficult things that would take place. There was conflict even in, within the church. You know, they, there were people in the church that said, we have the kingdom of God and we have this ungodly kingdom over here. And, and the church said, hey, I'm serving God. I'm going to forget about these guys. But the scripture is really clear about that we still have to surrender and submit to earthly forms of government. 
Amen? And so it's really important that we understand that. And that it's not just kingdom of God versus kingdom of darkness. And we must understand that God has instituted governments, whether it's um, a liberal government or whether it's a conservative government, God's behind these things in the long run. And when we start cherry picking of what we can obey and what we can do, then we're going to have all kinds of conflict. Now, in our nation, we've been invited and by means of our Constitution to give our opinion, to vote, to voice our opinion. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. It's very important. And so script, this scripture was designed to confront those conflicts that were taking place in the church. I don't need to obey the government. Jesus is Lord. Well, guess what? Try saying Jesus is Lord in front of a Roman column. You might have a different opinion about things. So they knew there were consequences about things. And so the very first thing that I want to make clear to us this morning as we get going is that God raises up governments. God raises He's the source behind what I believe is our country. God raises up governments. You can go to any government in the world and and I don't know if I absolutely believe with this, but I do believe there's a bit of a spiritual idea and concept behind this. Author Wiki Prattney says that many times people get not the government that they want, but the government they deserve. Ouch, huh? Right? And so it gives us the idea behind that. I don't know if I necessarily believe that in every situation, every circumstance. But I do know that if we don't appreciate what we have, we can lose it. That's right. And so it's very important. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God raises up one, lowers another. We have to know that God's behind what takes place. And why does that happen times? Because God's got a plan behind the scenes that a lot of times... You and I, in our own selfish mentality, we can't see what God's up to, but we have to realize He's up to something. God is always up to something. He's doing things that we can't always comprehend. He's up to something. Amen? So it's very important that we understand the United States is not the kingdom of God, but God has raised up this nation. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4-5 through 5 says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy, I love this, arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought and take it captive to obey Christ. What an amazing thing that in the church, God gives us ideas and concepts to destroy arguments to give us a reasoning behind what we're talking about so that we can speak clearly and have a clear voice. The trouble is that sometimes we react emotionally rather than having a clear perspective about what the Lord is up to. Amen? And so it's incredibly important that we have His voice, His ideas, and His concept, and not just our opinions. And I'm going I'm to say this because I spend a lot of time on the road, and it's easy for me to tune in to the latest TV guy, tune in to the latest conservative radio host. But I gotta tell you something. We as a church have to keep an ear tuned into what God says in His Word. Otherwise, we're just spouting off platitudes from everybody else. And the world doesn't need somebody else's opinion. The world needs what God wants to say and what God wants to do. How God is speaking to you in your personal life. That's what the world needs to hear. They, want, they need to hear that he's alive and he's working in your heart, first and foremost. And it's incredibly important that we establish that. You might go, well, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a teacher. Guess what? You are. Every person you come in contact with is a person that you can impact and a life that you can change. It's incredibly important that we understand that. Jesus is Lord over the nations. He is above Nations, He's above those things. He is um, works through them, but he's, he's above them. And then we have to see that. Romans 13, 1 through 7, it says, Let every person be subject to governing authorities. There is no authority except from God. And those who exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist incur judgment. And it's important that we understand that in, in these times, in these ungodly times, 
we have to go back to that place to where what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? John 19, verses 10 through 11. Pilate said to him, will you not speak with me? I mean, he had a, Pilate had a pretty good opinion about himself. Do you not know I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered and said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who has delivered me over to you has a greater sin. He's referring to uh, Herod at this point in time. But the idea that Jesus was submitted and brought to place of authority by earthly authorities, it's an amazing thing. Jesus submitted and recognized there's no authority except what God has established. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 13, it says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or a governor sent by him to punish those to do evil and praise to those who do good. For this is the will of God. You know, we could do a whole sermon series. Every time the Bible says, this is the will of God, well, there it is. That to doing good, we put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Why sometimes do we have so much ignorant talk? I think it's because the church needs to step up and minister to others. It's because we need that word of encouragement that people so desperately need. We have that word when nobody else has because our ear and our heart should be tuned into what God says in his word. Amen? Amen. And that's what the people need to hear more and above besides our opinions. They need to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say in these days and these times. Then it goes on and it says, live um, as people who are free. How many can say amen to that? Yeah, yeah. Not using your freedom to cover up for evil. We'll just kind of leave that right there. Amen? Amen. But living as the servants of God, yeah. honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Wow. Powerful words. And by the way, just in case we have anybody that you have any inclinations along that, if you want to do an interesting little research thing, go to go to Black Lives Matter and look at their manifesto. And you will find that they're not just for helping black people. They have really very little to do with helping black people. What they have is a Marxist agenda that says right there on there, it says we're there to to disestablish and we oppose the nuclear family. It says right there on their website. I saw it there this morning. And they are for every kind of transgender type of thing. They want to abolish the family when statistically, if you don't have a strong mom and a strong dad in your family, there's going to be all kinds of problems. Five times more suicide, more likely that you'll go to jail, more likely that other situations and circumstances will take place. So it's incredibly important you know, that we understand God has established the nuclear family. It's there for a reason. Amen? Amen? And that we need those things in our country. So it's very, very important that we understand that. And then it says, honor the emperor. Now, let's pause and take a uh, backward step. The emperor is killing Christians. <laughs> and yet, he says, First Peter, Peter says, honor the emperor. How do you do that? Well, you honor the office and not necessarily the man in that situation, that circumstance. He is the emperor. And so God tells us sometimes you have to honor people even though they may not be doing all the right things. They're still in charge. They're still the person. And no, we, we, we are Americans and we like to give our opinions. Amen? But we have to be careful at the same time. We have to be careful because so many times we are given over to share our opinion rather than give an idea about what, what's on God's heart. God has called our country. I just pause for a moment. Look at Jeremiah 27, verse 6. It says, God says this about non-Christian governments. And he speaks to Nebuchadnezzar years before Nebuchadnezzar is there even around there's a scripture where he talks about Cyrus will rebuild my temple. It's before Cyrus is even born, and they've done everything they can to say, no, 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 this wasn't written then. It was written before Cyrus was even born. So God knows. He knows what's going on. It says Cyrus will rebuild my temple. <laughs> I don't know if Cyrus goes, hey, well, that's a good idea. Let's do it. 
But I want to encourage you with something. God knows nothing takes him by surprise. He calls Jeremiah 27, 6 and says, I have given these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. This was a bad dude. And he says, this is my servant. Why was he his servant? Because he was going to do something that God had in mind. It wasn't that he was this guy dedicated to the Lord, but God had an idea. And so I want you to be encouraged. God knows he's up to something. He knows he is Lord over the nations. He is Lord over America. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. amen. Not only that, but God's called us to honor our country. Our country. And the, the scripture is so clear. It says, pay to what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So just ask questions, kind of real basic. What what do we love about our country? Do we love the people? Or some might go, ah, they're protesting. <laughs> complain about everything, you know? Is it the people or is it the land? Do we go, I love America because I love the land? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Is it our Constitution, you know? Do we go, is it, is it just, is it our constitution, that piece of paper that gives us our inalienable rights that God already said that he'd give us according to scripture, amen? Is it the constitution, is it, um, is it our form of government? Is it our <clears throat> politicians? Um, <laughs> what do you love about America? Well, I, I, I made a list and um, maybe you're not aware of these things, but why do I love this country? Why do I love this country? Because we are an incredibly friendly country. Now, you might live here in Vernal, you don't get it off and on a bus, and you know, but it, when I lived overseas, whether it was in Costa Rica or Nicaragua or in Chile uh, or other places that I've been, you could always tell Americans because they're, they're doing their best to be nice, you know? Doesn't mean other countries aren't nice, but we are marked sometimes by our niceness. And it kind of, you know, one day, I, as I got off the bus, I, I said, thank you to the bus driver. And my friend who was with me laughed and called me um, somebody from another religion. We'll just leave that one alone. And I joked and I said, hey, we're supposed to have an attitude of gratitude. Because I've been in a bus where the driver didn't stop completely and almost lost my life as I stepped to the ground and the bus is still moving. <laughs> you know, I, I was grateful, grateful that he was doing that. So we're a friendly place. You can start up a conversation about your favorite ice cream while you're standing in line at, at some place. You can talk about your favorite athlete or your least favorite athlete. You can, you, in America, you can be standing someplace and someone goes, wow, I... I I, I wonder what I ought to order. You know, you go, hey, this is really good. I've, tried, I've eaten this a lot of times. We love to share our opinion. We, we like that. Marks us as a country. We love to suggest places to eat as a, as a nation. It's an amazing thing, you know? See, you know, never listen to a skinny guy because he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, but here we, you know, we, as a country, we're really good at, at giving thoughts about, you know, this is really good restaurant. Someone goes, I like, you know, uh, La Comida, the, the plaza, and some other, no, no, Betos, and someone else, their favorite fruit food is, you know, I like Freddy's, you know, sorry, Freddy, you know, and, and, but it's an amazing thing. We are a friendly nation. Not only that, but we love to cheer for the underdog. Y'all, y'all do know that we helped invent Special Olympics because we want to see those who are underprivileged, those who have had difficulty. We love to cheer for the guy who has difficulties Who's going to make it? If um, if you're 85 years old and you go back to school and you get your degree, you're going to stand and you're going to applaud for that guy because we love to cheer for the underdog. You see somebody who's a, a, a one-legged cyclist who does a, a bicycle um, thing. You love to cheer for those people because you want to see them be able to. That's who we are as a country. We love to cheer for the underdog. Someone who's had difficulties, overcome those things. We get excited about that. Amen? Amen. We are opinionated. We love to give our ideas and, 
and thoughts and tell people our ideas. And it's not always a bad thing. You can usually know with an American, you can usually know within a few minutes what their agenda is because they're going to tell you. Whereas in other countries, we might dance around the issue quite a bit. But in America, we just tell it like it is, you know. And it was one of the hardest things for me living overseas is um, I'd call somebody and I'd say, hey, one, do you think you're going to do this? Like, I'm thinking about maybe in your mouth, you know, like this. He goes, hola, Pastor Lance. Como esta? Bien. Do you think that we can do like that? Como esta la esposa? My wife is funny. And then all of a sudden I realize, the greetings. I forgot the greetings. Because we Americans, we go right to the point. <laughs> and so, oh yeah, Debbie's fine. How's your wife? Oh, my wife is fine. And your children? Yes, my kids are fine. And your kids, how are they fine? You know, and, it, it, and after I calmed down, but for, it took me a little while because for the early part of the conversation, I'm doing this. <laughs> things to do. <laughs> you know? We love, we know within the first few minutes of dealing with American, you know what's going on because they, we love to get it out there, right out there, right away. Not only that, but we are a generous nation. We're a nation that loves to respond in generosity, not just supporting the underdog, but for causes that we believe in and we, we want to support things, we want to see things take place. We are one of the few places in the, in the world where homeless people can make a living <laughs> because we're so generous. It's not always a bad thing, but it does show that we are an incredible generous people. If someone dies, someone will take up an offering at work to help for flowers or for helping the family out. There's always someone who's taking up an offering for something to to encourage that. It's a part of our roots of who we are. We, we want to support. We want to encourage. We are a, a generous people. We love to give to different things. We give money simply because we trust them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but we're a people who forgives. You might go, not that good. <laughs> but as a whole, we are a nation that we like to forgive. You, you might have had so you might have done some things, and you might go, well, I don't want to admit it. hang in there, brother. Hang in there, sister, because in due time, you'll reap if you faint not. You, there's forgiveness. There's the reset button. In our country, if someone's open and honest and transparent, there's forgiveness, you know? It's one of the few countries in the world where someone can get on the air and go, I really blew it. And everybody goes, you're right. It's okay. Because <laughs> we're a forgiving nation. If someone's honest and transparent... People are willing to forgive. It's an amazing thing. If they go, no, I am so good that everybody else sets the standard. I set the standard for everybody else. And everybody's ready to pull that guy off this high horse, isn't it? aren't they? But people will forgive the, if someone who's honest the majority of the time. We love to try new things as a nation. You know, it's, you, you, can, you might go, well, this, for lunch, I'm going to go to Freddy's. But this evening, I'm going to eat Mexican or Chinese food. I, I might even have sushi. We don't have a sushi place anymore, but kind of sort of don't really have a Chinese sushi. Well, yeah, we do. We have a place there. All right. But we, we have all these, we'll try new things as a whole, you know? Do you know there's a statistic that I learned in, in another country? I don't think it's for here that if someone doesn't try a new food by the age of 50, there's a 90% chance that they'll never try it. But I think for the most part, here in the States, people will try anything at any point in time, as long as it's not like bugs and crickets for the most part. People are willing to try new things. And then not only that, we're a nation that loves to see just and fair. Just and fair. You might go, well, there's this injustice and this happened and it's not. Yeah, I know. I understand. You will always have unjust and things that will go wrong. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But as a whole in our country, we love to see just and fair take place. That's why we get so fired up if it's not if it's not right. We <laughs> I love this personally. It's you may not like it, but I think it's it's amazing. I love to make fun of the fact that there was a lawsuit because someone spilled coffee in their lap. <laughs> I mean, I look at that and I go, oh, brother, I can't believe it. Two million bucks for hot coffee. Yeah, right. But I also like the fact that in 1987, a woman sued the KKK 
<laughs> she won. She now owns the KKK headquarters. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing thing. Only in America would that take place and that happen. It's an amazing thing. Lawsuits, you might go, that's what's wrong with America. Well, if you've lived someplace where they don't have lawsuits, you know, the bus door opens, the ground is still going by, and they're looking at you like, jump. <laughs> yeah, you know, where, where, why do we have all these signs that says, caution, floor wet? Because someone got sued somewhere. We might go, that's ah, just wrong. It's, people need to wake up and pay attention to themselves. Well, if you're, in a country like ours is, where we like to keep an eye out for the underdog, you realize it's an important thing. And yeah, it might be what's wrong with America with the $2 million lawsuit over the coffee. I've tried so many times to get them to spill coffee on me, but it never works. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's an amazing thing. And when we realize that we have this amazing system of checks and balances in our country, we, we, you might have a sidewalk that does this, but overall, people, they go and they get it fixed because they're afraid this might get sued if it doesn't get taken care of. It's not all bad, folks, in that area. And then we love wide open everything. We love open floor plans in our country. We love open parks. We love open conversations, you know? We'll, you'll start having a conversation, someone will come up, have a conversation with you, they might walk away, come back, and love open conversation, open-ended everything. If you live in a large city in the United States, you may only have to drive 30 minutes to go camping almost anywhere in our country, which is an amazing thing. We love the idea of open, try going to Europe and saying, hey, I'm gonna go camping today. <laughs> it's not near as, near as easy, you know? But it's important that we understand that God has blessed our country. We have um, our own culture that's pretty much made to order. We have a consumer-driven society, and you might go, ah, we're greedy at Christmas time. Everybody's only concerned about themselves. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's an amazing thing, because if you go in and they realize that it's better to have this than that, this will begin to take the place. And you might go, well, that's just strange. Well, everybody prefers this drink over that drink, so we stock more of that drink. It's a consumer-driven society. You might go, well, well, I don't know. Well, that's everything in our culture is made to order. If you, if you are seven feet tall and we've developed a country of seven foot tall people, the car height will eventually change to modify and be ready for the seven foot tall guy. If you live, if we have, you know, people that are four foot two, the, the steering wheel and the dashboard might come down a little bit, but that's the way our culture and our society has, has been built. Everything's made to order here, you know? You don't want Brussels sprouts? You want broccoli instead? Hey, we'll get it for you. Try doing that in another country. We have a made to order society. If you build mouse traps and you can build a better mouse trap, you might make extra money on that. We love to make things more efficient. We love to make things stronger. We love to do it better because that's how we're driven. We love to make our culture made to order. And then last but not least, we have opportunities to learn and grow in this country. Our educational system. <laughs> now, I lived someplace for a long time. I'd be very careful with what I say here. But for the most part, if you started out to become a doctor, a lawyer, um, an architect, those first four years of that six or seven year degree were designed to teach you, but also to weed you out. Now in our country, you might have advisors, teachers, and staff who might actually be saying, hey, this is what we can do to help you to get along. This is how we can do to help you. This can help you. They want you to succeed because it makes their university look good that they didn't produce a lot of people who failed the classes. They want you to succeed. Our country is designed to produce opportunities. We love to see a guy who succeeds and steps up and rises to the occasion. Amen? Amen. Whereas a lot of other countries designed to weed people out. And it's a scary thing when you look at somebody 
who, whether they're dyslexic or something else, and has been pushed down and told that they're dumb, and it's a scary thing when you watch that. Our country, we want to encourage people, we want to see people set up, step up and do well. Well, I found this amazing quote. I'm not sure, I looked it up because I like to research if a quote is really true. Um, I've heard it for years, and they're actually recorded of about eight or nine different politicians who have quoted this. Alexei de Tocqueville, he's a French guy who came to America to study what makes America great. And he, he said the following phrase, he says, I sought for greatness and genius of America in our commodious harbors and ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. I sought for greatness and genius in America in her public school system, and this is written back in the 1800s, by the way, in her public school system and institutions of learning, and it was not there. I sought for greatness and genius of America in her democratic con Congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the genius and power of America. America is great because she is good. And if America ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. Amen? Amen. I love this verse. Can we go back a couple slides? <coughs> Just look at that, this one quote further back. Sorry, Phyllis. It's, um, go back, there, right there, Second Chronicles 7.14. It says, if my people who are called by my name, this pause right there. Anybody here, you consider yourself one of God's people? Amen. 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 Anybody here? You've, you're a Christian, you're called by his name? Yes. Amen. And then it goes on, it says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Wait a minute, I'm one of your people, how can I have wicked ways? How we have wicked ways? It says, humble themselves and pray. Because sometimes we get so caught up in our world that we forget about his world and what God wants to do in our country. I want to tell you that I believe one of the greatest things that we can do as a nation, as Americans, is to pray for our country. Because there it says, my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. It says, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Anybody feel like that our land needs healing? Yes. Yeah. Amen. You know, how does it get healed? When my people who are called by my name, it's easy for us to go, well, those dirty, rotten sinners, they have this law and they do this thing. Country's not judged on those people. My people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray. I just wonder if this morning we would see that the greatest thing that we can do for our country is to pray for our country. Pray for our leaders, whether they're Democrat or Republican, and believe God, for God to speak to their hearts and God to move upon them. I've seen it before. <laughs> I met a lady who, um, uh, I'll just tell you, when we were in Latin America, I heard the Nationals making fun of her Spanish quite a bit. She was very tall, very lanky, and um, and they would make fun of her Spanish. But I was, in my mind, I said, when you've planted five churches, then you can make fun of her all you want in front of me. But at this point in time, don't do it. <laughs> very tall, lanky, and very American. 
Well, she gets a call one day. She says, is this Audrey Manning? She said, yes, it is. She said, the voice said, um, you pray for the sick. Yes, I do. Well, in about five minutes, there's going to be a car that's going to be coming around. And we'd like you to get in it without asking any questions and not telling anybody. <laughs> no. How would you react? <laughs> She's like, okay, all we can tell you is you'll be very safe. So in about five minutes, right on cue, this large car appears and she gets in the car. She gets ushered into the presidential palace of Chile. And there's Peter Shedd, <laughs> the ruler, the supreme ruler at that point in time over the nation of Chile. Wow. And they bring her in and they said, he has a medical problem, would you pray for him? <laughs> and I wanna tell you something, she prayed for him and God healed him. You don't know what your prayers will do, whether it's to speak to somebody else or God to raise somebody else up. But I want to tell you something. The greatest thing you can do for this nation is to pray for this nation. God has blessed America. We have an amazing people. We have amazing land and government. God has blessed our country. Yeah, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. But how many of you throw your car away when you get a flat tire? <laughs> God has blessed our country. Amen. So I want to ask if we would just take time and ask God to bless our nation. Yes. So um, Jamie or Karen, if one of y'all could come and, and just play, and we could just take some moments. If you want to come up front to the altars and pray, if you want to kneel to where you're seated, then I want something that's going to mark our hearts and our lives where we say, today, on this day, July 5th, I prayed for God to bless my country. Amen? Amen. Ben, did you want to say something or are you agreeing with me? Okay, we will. Dwight and Kay, when we begin to pray, if you can come close to, to her and begin to pray for her. Yes. So I want to invite you to get along with the Lord. Get on your knees. Come forward. Whatever you feel comfortable doing. But I want it to be marked in your heart, in your life, that today you prayed for our country. Amen? Amen. Father.